Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Garrett and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to our second mini course of the academic year. Um, I'm welcoming you on behalf of both uh, the Evanston Public Library and the Northwestern Emeriti Organization. Our course is titled Black Abstract Art and Black Imaginations. Our instructor will be Professor Soini Madison of Northwestern University's Department of Performance Studies. Professor Madison has researched and taught at Northwestern since 2007, serving as chair of the department between 2010 and 2016. She became an emerita in 2020. Her research interests include critical performance ethnography, adaptation and direction of oral history and literary texts, and the relationship between human rights and political economy. Her most recent book is the third edition of her Critical Ethnography, Method, Performance, and Ethics, published by the University of Washington Press in 2019. The first edition was in 2005, and it's been very successful since. Among her many honors and teaching awards, she is the 2021 recipient of the Performance and Theory and Practice Award for Achievement in Academic Theater of the Association for Theater and Higher Education. This is, as I said, the second mini course that are, is being offered as a partnership between NEO, the North American Ameri the Northwestern Emeriti Organization and Evanston Public Library. We are now in the fifth year with this collaboration. With that, I'd like to hand things over to our speaker this evening, Professor Madison. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, very much. Do you want to talk about how we're going to do the questions in the chat? Uh, yes, yeah. I can yeah. say that if you have questions at any time, please put them in the chat and we will get to as many as we possibly can, uh, either like in the middle of the presentation. I, I believe that Professor Madison will be stopping uh, for a little bit of time to answer some initial questions. Mm -hmm. And then after she's finished, uh, we hope to have 15, 20 minutes or more uh, to deal with questions and comments. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. I'll sure. probably stop when we get through specific sections to give it a little time. And then at the end, we can really open it up for questions and discussions. Before Excellent. we go on to, um, the next slide and the presentation, I wanna give you an idea of what you're looking at. This is a piece by Elle Vandy. She is a black British artist who employs found and made objects to reflect black migrations and commodities in reimagining a colonial, uh, colonial histories. She turns model boat hulls into masks using various materials such as porcupine quills and acupuncture needles. We'll be learning more about her next week when we go on to more contemporary artists. All right, thank you. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so I wanna give you an idea of how I'm organizing um, our class tonight. Um, we have two sessions today will be in class one and we'll be looking at black abstract art during the civil rights and black power movements. So I'm really um, trying to historicize what we're talking about when we talk about black abstraction and black imaginations. And because we only have two, two classes, it would be great to go to the very beginning um, and with some detail I will give you some foundational histories of that, but that will be very brief. Um, but the focus, the main focus will be during the civil rights era, era, era and the black arts movement. Um, maybe at some point we can talk about black abstraction during the Harlem Renaissance or even black abstraction uh, during the transatlantic slave trial because there was a lot of abstraction in terms of not only art, but in terms of um, clothing and objects and even the way folks imagine the world in abstract ways. All right, but I'm just focusing on the civil rights uh, era and the black arts movement as a beginning point in depth 
and then moving up next week to um, more contemporary artists. All right, so we can go into the next slide. All right, um, the haunting backdrops of black abstraction. Even though we're focusing on the civil rights and black power movement era, I do want to provide some foundation um, around issues of realism and the industrial revolution and the invention of photography, the wild beast and the impressionist, breaking the rules from spirituality to cubism, World War I, avant-garde, and to the left of capitalism, World War II, abstract expressionism, and jazz sensibilities. And this is only to provide a kind of backdrop for how we're looking at black abstraction in the modern and in the contemporary um, domains. Because this, these beginning European movements do serve as a kind of haunting backdrop for all of that. Um, and maybe I'll spend, I didn't quite time it, but I don't think it should be over about 10 minutes that we'll go through this. I know this is a long period and a lot going on, but just to, to provide a kind of jumping off point um, as to what the influences were before we get on to um, those other time periods. Okay, the next slide. So it seems that most everything starts with realism. And we know with the invention of photography, that changed how we perceived and imagined the real, all right? Um, these two pieces, I chose these because these are the, some of the classic um, selections that are usually um, thought about when we, uh, when we talk about realism. And it was interesting, I thought, we're still on slide one. And it was interesting um, to, to look at these two in terms of realism because of the composition, the color, the shading, and what might be discerned as um, issues of caste or class, all right? So we can, we can move on to the next slide. All right. Um, in this imaginings of realism, I wanted to bring in Augusta Savage, 1892-1962, and Edmonia Lewis, because I thought it would be a good idea to, with the accompaniment of the European earlier um, forms here and images, to bring these two women into the discussion of realism. We know that uh, with Augusta Savage, she's most known for that, I, I wish I could have gotten a slide of that, the harp piece, which was entitled uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing, but much of her work dealt with black bodies and much of the work dealt with black bodies that were in some position or formation where it was a collective. We know that Edmonia Lewis um, spent most of her time in Rome, uh, but much of her work, uh, her sculptor's work dealt with women and indigenous people. She was mixed race as African-American and Native American. And between 1872 and 1879, um, she was commissioned to do quite a bit of abolitionists I guess you'd call it abolitionist bust making. Um, so she, she kind of moved away from um, the work around indigeneity to make more of, of that kind of work. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so the next uh, epic I want to, 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 to carry on from there, from the realism is the surrealism. And now we're getting into the territory where we don't have to focus so much on realism. We have photography. There's a there's a industrial age now. And artists were beginning to think that what we see is not necessarily the aim to make it real. 
that there are shadows, that there are resonances of colors that we can imagine beyond what is apparent to us, that the composition does not have to be as it is, yes? So most often when folks are beginning to really get into the depths of abstraction, um, and we talk about what are, what are the beginning roots of that, particularly from a European's perspective, kind of begin with moving from the exact to um, what I would like to call the beginning of the shadow and perhaps a little messiness, all right? We can move on. All right, as with the realist image, I also want to bring in a black imagination presence into this. Um, this Van Gogh piece to your left um, is certainly one of those pieces um, that I think is, is important to talk about kind of impressionism. Um, as were the last last two, they were not. It wasn't so much surreal. I'm getting away with myself with these with these um, descriptions, but with the impressionistic work, the shadows and the blurs and the colors that are so often blended together. So the impressionist work here of Van Gogh, I want to again, like like we did with the realism, bring in uh, a classic. Uh, African American or Black American uh, example. And we know that Henry, I don't know why that Taylor is at the end, it should be Tanner, uh, the banjo lesson. And what's so interesting about this banjo lesson, we know this is a classic painting. Many of us have seen this before, but um, I don't know if we understand perhaps the politics of this, of this piece. Banner was very intentional and purposeful in the in kind of impressionistic paintings that he produced because he was very concerned with um, the images uh, projected uh, around black people and blackness as being taken seriously and as being um, reverent. I guess today we would call it kind of respectability politics, but it, it's really not that. And I've heard people talk, be concerned about these images, but we know this is 1893 as opposed to 2024. So what was at stake in terms of imagery? Um, it's like what Stuart Hall would say, how you're represented is how you are treated. So I think that was in the mix of Tanner's um, concern around painting and doing the labor of painting um, and the work and effort that was required in terms of his presence. He lived in Paris for most of his life. Um, it was to really present black people as human, as caring for one another and as to be respected. Okay, we can go into the next. Okay, so now we're moving into, um, some of you are, I'm sure, are very familiar with this one here. I see, let me just check my notes a minute. Um, so we move from the impressionistic moment to what is often termed even getting more loose with what we see and can define as the real, as the apparent, as the discernibly true. And that is what was termed um, the, the wild beast. This notion that the, the painterly efforts and energy that hit the page, the colors that are selected can be free of, of, of the concern around replication, that there's movement and there can be joy, they can, there can also be um, tragedy, but there's this a sense of more freedom uh, of expression than the notion of exactness of a moment. So this was um, called Matisse's, what, Matisse's The Dance. 
And you see the dancers within this whole era that where painting became bolder and color and form and figures, that there's this reach toward a kind of collective reverie of rhythmic joy, holding hands, circling naked in nature in celebration of the archetypal desire for collective movement and music together. Um, this piece, we it's also true that it was commissioned by uh, a Russian businessman, no less takes away from that effort uh, of art to now feel that we're free from the constraints of depicting the real. Okay, next one. Okay, um, now finally we're moving on to um, abstraction. And it's so interesting because I, I hope I'm pronouncing her, her name correctly, but it's the Theosophy movement, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this and have perhaps even studied it and may know more about it than I do. But it was in 1862 that Hilma Klint was said to be one of the first abstract artists, uh, even before Kandinsky and the rest, um, that she was interested in a new form of spiritualism, that she was considered actually a mystic. Um, and in this, this mysticism, in this spirituality um, that Clint, she was, she was Swedish, um, that her, her inclination toward the mystic was so interestingly compared to the scientific, that there was these tensions going on among this, what is scientific in terms of light and how light is produced, even infrared light, um, even uh, the electromagnetic field still held a kind of spiritual cast over it. And that cast can be honored, respected, revealed, ritualized on paper with paint and color. But it all came from this, um, the theosophical came from this of feeling this urge, this commitment to spirituality. And this is where we begin, and this is where we begin with form and shape and the notion that maybe color and shape and form now becomes a subject. And what can be understood as mystic or spiritual cannot necessarily always be depicted in the real, in the human form, uh, through prayer or through some kind of religious rite. Okay, now. All right. Um, so I want to talk about this piece. Let's see, do I have a... Um, I don't have my notes on this one, but I know it pretty well, I think. <laughs> Uh, this piece also takes up with Vasily Kandinsky, who was also considered one of the first European abstract artists who used shape and form and line and also believed that it was important to understand that all of this comes out of the feeling um, that color and line and shape gives us um, a meeting with the spiritual. All right. Okay, this is another Kandinsky piece, um, I believe. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, but this one also um, is the idea, what number is this, can you tell me? Because it's not coming up on mine. It's can number 11. Number 11. Okay, very great. Okay, very great, very great. That, um, that, that, that the shape, the line, the abstraction, the geometrics, the color are all in service of the kind of uh, tradition that comes out of um, this notion of, of, of 
of the spiritual. And that not only that, that it has what they would, that what they called um, the kind of primitive um, um, innocence out of which color, shape, and form can then elevate to the spiritual. Okay, let's keep moving. Next slide. Okay. All right, now we have uh, gone to the Cubist movement where recognizable subjects are now depicted as abstract cubes. And they are influenced again uh, in what Picasso was documented as saying through tribal African art forms and other folk art forms through um, later on, they're talking about the, the philosophy of Carl Jung. And I'll talk about Carl, Carl Jung shortly because it's difficult to make this kind of transition between impressionism, the notion of spirit, spirituality and the philosophical and then uh, Picasso's cubism without bringing in um, this philosophy of Carl Jung. Um, and that, that all humankind has certain beliefs and certain um, emotional structures and in the way we live our lives, just being human um, and through uh, how we interact with whatever we are confronted with relative to pain and hardship, love or nature, there is a common thread. Um, there is this archetypal reality and this archetypal reality, the archetype that all humans possess um, is also very much located and equated in the unconscious. So that's now really being played out through this movement from um, um, Impressionism to the spiritual into Cubism. So that's all coming now together. Okay. All right. So, and I am going to, yes, and if you have questions or comments, uh, we are going to get to them, but I kind of want to, um, I'd like to wrap up this segment first before we go on to the next one. All right. This one and the, 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 the following uh, ones are looking at the actual material of color, line, and shape, and how that can be manipulated again to affect the soul. Artists, artists are noticing something that color actually does. Everything can be depressed down to color and form in this movement toward a European abstraction. Um, let's go to the next one. Color, shape, form, now. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the famous or infamous black box here, how color is perceived. The black square represents feeling in the white void. Space is as significant as shape here. This notion that in all of this space, in terms of how we're perceiving it, how we think of our conscious and our unconscious as we live in space, as those lines are taking us into the space, as the color is making us feel or if we are slow looking, does it make us feel a certain way about being at the top, at the bottom, over to the side? The black lines, what are they doing? Um, both of these artists believe that everything is perception and only by abstracting objects can we get to reality. So I'm pausing here for you to, to, to look at this and, and ask the question, what is going on here? There is so much space here. 
where are we in this space and what does it do? And what do we mean by this whole notion that space has its own meaning? and that space is doing something here. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, why don't we pause here for a minute and if there are any questions or comments before we go into post-World War II and uh, Jackson Pollock and all of that. Those previous slides were just a launching point for when we get into black abstraction, where many of these artists um, had gone to the schools in Europe, in Paris, in Italy, and Kadinsky and uh, might have been thought of as one of their heroes. No questions so far, Sweeney. No questions so far? Okay. There's something AC to everyone. So interesting how much. So interesting how much angle and line are present in the Malevich. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. There, there is there is a, a, a comment, but not yes. circles. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I know I'm speeding through this, but I think it's better to at least acknowledge it and maybe show you some of the images before we really get into the... Um, how these are both influenced by the, the civil rights movement, the black power movement um, around these, these early paintings, how they change for us when we think about them and how they also influence what we'll see during those eras, okay? So these connections are going to come up, but they can't come up unless I show you those images in the beginning. Okay, so here we are. Um, can you tell me the number on this one? Uh, you're in number 15. Very great. Thank you. Thank you. So after World War II, many European artists migrated to the U U.S. and formed yet another avant-garde. Because when we think from going from realism to um, um, impressionism, that was a kind of avant-garde when the lines got fuzzy and the colors got mixed. And then when we went from there to the notion of spirituality and then the wild beast, there are all of these moments of change um, that are so interesting before we can really begin to think about splashing paint on paper and that being, um, a performative act of itself that has meaning and that meaning can often be uh, political. So um, let me just repeat, after World War II, many European artists migrated to the US and formed yet a new avant-garde referred to as abstract expressionism. We have landed folks, we have landed, okay? And admittedly emerged from and were influenced by African, Asian, Native American, cultural and traditional art forms, including ancient myths and a resurgence again of Carl Jung and most importantly, universally jazz. So now we're at the point where Carl Jung may meet John Coltrane at one level at another level where we see paint meeting the canvas and at another level where the paint brush becomes yet a tool that can be contorted and even disappeared in the work of Jackson Pollock. Next slide. You see him, oh, and then what, one more thing. I want you, wanted you, that's okay. You saw him in his studio, all right? And I, you wonder, okay, this was 1950. There's a certain way that we can think about this work that's made for us in the environment of which it is made. The calm, the quiet, the luxury of having your studio 
where you can make this art like this. All right, and the space. I think that's part of the way we want, we also want to appreciate it and also think about it. Lee Krasner is the wife of Jackson Pollock. And she was also, um, she was also an abstract uh, painter. And she was also looking at how we can uh, embrace color itself as the subject of the artwork. And that the actual materials that are used to make line, shape, and color uh, have the capacity to affect our nervous systems, uh, the capacity for us to feel a certain kind of way and think about this paint as kind of action painting and that the imagination can be most expansive and that there's a kind of emergence when we sit with it for a time um, where our senses begin to, to keep almost kind of in lockstep um, with what we're seeing. Okay. So here we have um, William de Kooning with, along with his wife as well. You see, when we think about de Kooning and we think about Jackson Pollock, some people don't know that they had wives who were also painters. Um, for them, color represents emotion, and this these colors representing emotions are ra also radiating bands, uh, are radiating bands of circuitries of more colors. Um, they are interested in also the materiality of color, how it feels in the on the brush, how it moves across the canvas, um, how it's constituted by vertical and horizontal lines and how it creates certain kind of spatial illusions. Um, and that what was quoted, I think this was by Kooning saying, spatial illusion is replaced by truth. All horizontal and vertical lines structure, structure the world through binary opposition. All right. Now let's go on to the next one. I wanted to bring um, Elaine de Kooning and Lee Krasner's pieces together um, because I don't know how often we actually, we know de Kooning and we know Pollock, but how often we really put the uh, wives of these two very popular and revered artists together in terms of their own work. There is this idea of slow looking, and I think that there was, um, well, I know that there was a day um, that was celebrated as a way for folks to come together and um, travel to art circles, where it's museums or in, in the homes of people or wherever art was on display to take that day and sit with the artwork and look at it slowly. <clears throat> so that's what I'm inviting you to do right now, is just to take a little time, not at both of them together, but choose one, just choose one, and just take your time and follow the lines. And as you follow the black lines, Look at where the paint hits the line or maybe superimposes over another color and how it's shaped over by the green. Because if you look at it without slow looking, you'll miss it. The same with the one to the right. It's almost meant as um, a kind of meditative way that we can, um, see what's before us.
Okay, next slide. Mark Rothko. So <clears throat> up to this point, we've been talking about shape, the triangle, the vertical, the horizontal. Um, we, we've talked about color's relationship to other colors, and we've talked about slow looking. Rothko was very concerned that when one looks at his paintings, that they, they actually spend some time seeing the color and what is the color doing? What is the color doing? And what is it doing next to the other color? And how are these lines and shapes relatable? My question is, When we come to these kinds of paintings and there's no narrative, there's no figure, and you just have blocks of color on a canvas, how do we look at it? Why is that important? How does it change us? What does it do in the world? Why does it matter? Why does it cost so much? And one of the, the more popular uh, responses, I think to much abstract art is, my kid could do that. My dog could do that. Give him some paints and let him splash around on the floor. Next slide. Okay, so I wanna take a pause here because the next set of slides are also looking at traditions. Um, but they'll be looking at African traditions, art traditions, and what are the patterns and symbols and uses of those artistic formations and what do they do? Um, continents away from Europe. So the question is, how do we look at abstract art? I'm offering this as a kind of starting point for what you're seeing. So maybe the question of how do we look at abstract art is to actually pinpoint what's there. So we know patterns and compositions. So far, that's what we've seen. Much of them much of the lines, many of the patterns are vertical, horizontal, diagonal, symmetrical, cruciform, radial, rigid. And I have another slide where it shows you these. Um, radial, there's a radial grid, constellations, tensive in terms of the colors and maybe even the lines further or closer apart. A lot of repetition, overlapping, frames even, overlapping frames, meanderings, curves, lines, splattering, and rule of thirds. We know the rule of thirds is where there's a, there is an object or a focal point that's not at the center. It's a little bit askew to the right, maybe down to the left, at a third of wherever the um, space is, but never quite in the center. Color field where color is the subject. It doesn't paint a subject. It doesn't lend itself to tell a story or make an image, but it is the subject itself. Large fields of color, large scale canvas where there is an expanse of color with little or no, no surface imagery or detail or form. So this is what we're seeing when we look at um, these European offerings of abstract art. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is from David Kessler Fine Art. You can just type him up on the internet and you'll get his grid here. 
I chose, this is taught in many art schools and many people um, have used this to help them kind of get an idea of what, what we're seeing and, you know, what kind of um, design or patterns are there? How do we name them? Um, but I chose this one because I like it. Um, he has examples over to the right of what they look like. So this is the cruciform here. You see it as a line that's more distinct. And then you see it over to the right as a painting. The horizontal, you see it as a line and then you see the horizontal as a painting. And you all can see that, right? The verticals in the painting that match the vertical um, in the uh, ink drawing, the diagonal in the ink drawing and the diagonal in the painting. Unbalanced, what is unbalanced about that? Over to the right as opposed to the left. The three spot triangular or the rule of thirds, you see here, up, here, down. We could turn it around, it would be the same thing but there the middle is open. There's a lot of that in abstract work. Curvilinear, you see the curves inside curves, inside other curves, and just slide a kind of spiral. In the other slide I said radiating. I, I, you'll notice that I offered more descriptions, but this is still helpful to that because it gives you a visual. The group mass, when we look at black abstract artists, you're gonna see a lot of group mass, the balance and the radiating, okay? 10 classic designs, thank you. All right, so let's look at this for a little while. Just a few, few seconds, all of those dots, all of those colors. We have now entered into the next segment, which is traditional African art. This is a traditional African art design from West Africa, and it is a piece of cloth. There's no one name here because it is most often collectively done, made, and designed. What makes this work interesting after seeing, I think the Europe, the, the, the other images, the European images is to know that this is, was done in a community of people taught through um, tradition and generations and collectives and that it is cloth. It's not gonna hang up on a wall it is going to be worn. Next slide. This is another pattern design from, from West African art traditions. And the slide previous to these, when we outline those 10 compositions and designs, you see these as what? a kind of grid, a repetition, a vertical mark, a contrast here. It's no less abstraction. This is also cloth. It's art, it's abstraction, it's collective, it's traditional, and it is to be worn. And it is done for the sake of its use value, but also to make something beautiful. Okay, let's go to the next one. It's mud cloth. This cloth is much thicker, it's much heavier. Um, you see that the geometric designs are more distinct. And take a little bit of time and follow those lines. The texture of this is not smooth like the cotton. It's much more um, coarse. The colors are not as 
vivid or striking, but the colors are still colors and they're still contrasting and they're moving. The lines feel as though they're moving. Next. This is cotton. This is also, I think this is from, I'm so sorry. I think this is, this, I think this is, I think I got this in Ghana. Maybe it could be, yeah, it's Ghanaian cloth. But these patterns and these colors and this, this way of um, making fabric beautiful in this way is, trans versus South Saharan Africa. You see it in South Africa, East, West. And when you remember back on those compositions and those designs, how the this work here, this artistry here, uh, adheres to that as well. What, so my question would be, what do these traditional African art examples here, how are they the same and different from what we saw in terms of the abstraction term in um, European art? Okay, next one, please. You can see this is like done in panels. Next one, please. All that you're seeing now is cloth. Used for tablecloths, for clothing, for drapes. Young and old, the cover. Next, please. This is also one in panels. This is from, from Senegal. Where you see the cloth is made, but also threaded. Okay, the next one, please. Used as bowls, as containers, as chairs, as jewelry. So great. Okay, I want to see two more slides. So I would like to move from the continent to North America and the traditional art in North America. This is a Native American bowl. This is also a traditional piece with a traditional design. So now that we're looking at traditional art, collective traditional art handed down through generations for beauty and for use, let's go to the next slide and look at, yeah, what, the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, that's right there. That's okay, that's okay. This is a Native American um, modern artist, Edna Massey, and this is, one of her abstract paintings, 1950. 
the lines are much more, there's no splattering going on here. You can see that. And you can also see that there are two colors and it feels as though one color is to highlight the motion in the other color. Still dealing with geometric forms and somewhat hard edges. The next one. Next slide, please. This is softer. This is another Native American, a more contemporary, more modern painter, George Morrison, white painting, more contemporary artist. Also uh, from most in CNA collection. This particular museum um, collects more Native American art. It's really um, very supportive of Native American art and specializes that and honors that work. Okay, the next one. The contrast, the cluster and the concentration. Next one. I wanted to bring this one in, 1941, shamans creating a large sand painting at the 1941 Indian Art of the United States exhibition. So you can see the audience there looking at the way these abstractions are being made in sand. Next one. Okay. So traditional art here in the US that is worlds and experiences away from the tradition of, of um, impressionism and surrealism and cubism and uh, the concern around geometric shapes and color and contrast is within the African-American quilting tradition. And what do I've been, I've been talking about abstraction and making comparisons and contrasts in terms of how it moves and develops and evolves into these different periods. And um, also talking about that against African traditional um, crafts and arts. But when we talk about abstraction, what do we mean? What we mean is the point of it is not a replication. There isn't a figure. There isn't necessarily an outside reference that one wants to copy or that one wants to take up in a way to re-represent it in the art space. But it is um, a symbol, it is a mark, um, it is a collection of marks and lines in figures, shapes, and colors that in and of itself produces its meaning without having the outside figure or the outside reference. That's what we mean by abstraction. So the quilting uh, tradition in African-American art is going to be brought up a great deal when we look at uh, black abstraction in the next uh, segment, because there's a lot of reference to that. One artist in particular talks about that as um, a way that became his kind of saving grace when he was um, really degraded and demeaned for um, his work. Just imagining these women who were making these designs um, from fabric and didn't necessarily have studios or even, um, I'm talking about this early work, 
and and her even putting this up on the line, we know this was at some point in the 19th century, um, putting this up on the line after cleaning, but who taught them? They were taught through the ages. And why is it um, important to have design and color and shape and form on a fabric just to keep warm? Why? That's a lot of work. And it's a lot of work for the sake, I think, of beauty, community, the collective, and purpose. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, this is one where I really liked it because it's Lucy P. Pettyway and uh, it's her granddaughter that has kept this piece. And she talks about how her mother taught her how to do this work. And um, this is another kind of lesson that she learned in terms of when it's made by machine and when the fabrics are put together by hand. Okay, next one. I tried to find the um, a description or um, more text on this one and I just couldn't find it. Um, it, it, I hope it's out there somewhere, I'm sure it is, but I wanted to include this because of all the detail, all the colors, all the shapes, and because there is figuration in here and how these quilts often were a response to politics and the state and the neighborhood uh, and family, um, popular culture, governance so much is in a quilt and i thought it was also just so interesting in terms of the design here doesn't i doesn't necessarily you see a pattern in the center but at the corners there's such a distinct pattern there thank you go on to the next slide okay so now we're going to we're going into the meat of the presentation how much time time do I have? Is it seven o'clock for real? Get about yeah. About oh my goodness. Twenty minutes. <laughs> I can't believe it. Okay. All right. So maybe I should continue on and oh my goodness. Okay, too much on the Europeans all the time. Always have it. Okay. Black abstract artists from the civil rights and black arts era. Color, nature, grid, and repetition. Okay. Next slide. All right, Richard Hunt. Richard Hunt passed recently. He was a Chicago-born artist. Um, and he said, in, in some works, it is my intention to develop the kind of forms nature might create if only heat and steel were available to her. Richard Hunt executed and welded and cast in cast steel, aluminum, copper, bronze. Hunt's abstract creations make frequent references to plants, human and animal forms. And it's so there's so, uh, what's so interesting about Hunt's work is the lines are, are most often so clear, but they also um, are hybrid in that it can be a plant, animal or human form all at once, like this one to your right. Next. Melvin Edwards, a uh, very interesting artist. He changed the structure. He believed in changing the structure of museums from the inside. Received a lot of criticism um, during that era with, with artists who were doing this work and people just couldn't figure, is it a piece of machinery? Um, what does this mean? But we see this and we understand and resonates with us that these, that what he deals with has to do with shackles and containment and confinement. 
and he changed the formal materials and elements of modern sculpture in terms of metals to show how these metals were also used as um, incarceration and enslavement. Next one. Here he's he has one of his one of his his signatures is to use wires connected to the chains. This is one especially that focuses on this notion of what it means to be behind wire, perhaps barbed wire that's conjoined with the chain. And how does that work historically? Next, please. MacArthur Binion brings to us um, uh, a kind of um, testament to African traditional arts, almost looking as though it's kente cloth, um, but it's paint. Binion employs materials such as oil-based paint, stick, ink, and graphite to create dense interlacing grids on the surface of his paintings. Um, and when and a lot of his paintings, you can see like shadows often of words and images. Haradina Pendel is the next one, please. Uh, Haradina Pendel extended the surfaces of her abstract work because she was very much wanting to communicate the complexity, complexity, complexities around blackness and the trope, the notion of surface, the surface of the skin, the surface of pain upon the skin, the surface of objects out of which blackness reaches and can touch. She cuts up canvases and she will put them back together. She punches, one of her signature peaches is to punch thousands of holes and imbue them to a surface to reflect the complexity of what it means to think about a surface. The surfaces that, that you can acquire, the surfaces that you can hold, the surfaces of blackness and black bodies. And you can see to the left, the, um, the materials that she uses to make these punches, these pun these hole punches, and puts them together to think about um, how one can take the materials, create these these holes, and then refigure them into something that might be might appear to be useless, or might appear to be how much is missing or absent from the clear and the solid surface. Okay, let's go on to the next one. This is Mary Lovelace O'Neill. She takes us back to the notion of the grid and the one um, moment in the painting where we see red. Um, and what, where is that? where does that red come from? Why is it there? And what is its relationship to her notion of uh, the steam engine and the scarcity of um, she 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 will have these bold surfaces sometimes with lots and lots of color but there'll be one color that's left that represents something that is missing something that is um, um, that might have been plentiful at one time but now is scarce amongst all of this whiteness and the degradation of whiteness. All right, let's go on, next one. William T. Williams is a very interesting fellow. He talks about his diamond figurations representing resistance to all confined spaces. He sees his work as confrontational, the vertical and the horizontal. He talks about in his work, the vertical colors and lines and planes and the horizontal colors and lines and planes, how they push against each other in the square frame. He's also one of the um, artists who is part of the smokehouse painters and the smokehouse painters 
were also a kind of response to the murals in the 60s that had black figures and that were more apparent and um, were recognizable as protest murals. And she, and what Williams is doing is a lot of the smokehouse uh, public paintings, they would paint on walls as murals and uh, bring other community members in there to talk about what does it mean when you have lines and forms and shapes and you're in a space that is taking you in different directions, but there's always another shape or form preventing you so that there's no clear path. And in both of these paintings, this is how he is describing himself as confrontational. He says, my work is confrontational. Okay, let's go to Sam Gilliam, the next one. All right, we're very, most, most people are very familiar with Sam Gilliam. He is another um, color plane artist. This painting to the right was in commemoration of the death of um, Martin Luther King on this purple field where you see the fading out of the colors, but the red represents King's blood. To the left, he wants, this is um, a painting where he is stating that with paint, you can have it on the canvas or it can be on a board, but it's frame upon frame upon frame that prevents and that can block your vision from the overall landscape that is behind it. Next, please. Um, this is Edward Edward Saunders. Um, it's so, I mean, I'm sorry, Edward Clark. Um, Edward Clark is another interesting painter. He uses in terms of, of in terms of thinking about um, breaking with uh, traditional kinds of ways that one puts paint on paper and puts it within a black context, he will use like um, a broom, a house broom, roller, rags. And he says he sees himself as a performance practice painter that's also identifying with, man, men, with menial labor or manual labor, um, that as he uses these colors, he's moving his body, he may be moving his broom, he may be moving his brush, and he continues to work on it freely, um, bringing up these colors and, and acknowledging that this is, a, this is a kind of labor that the color works for uh, the viewer. I think Frank Bowling is next. Okay. This is Raymond Saunders. This is another um, painter that looks at the canvas in a multimedia way, that there are different textures, acrylics, oils going on against a black backdrop, and the ways that he wants to communicate um, moments of stark fortitude against a plain backdrop that's against competing uh, forms and shapes. Next one. Okay, Frank Bowling uh, is, is in, I think it's important to know his work. He's called a map, he does what they call map paintings. And he's looking at um, the colonial epic and how the world and continents were reshaped and reformed during coloniality and what and how water changes and water is always involved in this transportation this rerouting this re redirecting this re rearranging um, people throughout history and geography and if we could see that to the right you could see the maps um, 
of continents. You can see the land mass there. You see Africa. And then you see upon it, superimposed upon it, are is paints that seems to be moving in motion and that is water. But he was very much concerned with looking at the notion of um, water and the violence in water and the geographies that have transported through water and transported people. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Sam Gilliam. Another painter, I think we talked about him before. I have Sam throughout here. Okay, Beverly Buchanan. What's important about Beverly Buchanan is here is a major work of American outdoor sculpture and hiding in plain sight. What looks from afar like random trio of rocks over there are in fact constructions of concrete topped by what's called tabi. It's a historic material in this region formed from oyster shells, sand, and water. These are what, uh, if you know Be uh, Beverly Buchanan's work, she's concerned with ruins, R-U-I-N-S, ruins. These are marsh ruins, as they are called. She built them in 1981. These three to your right, the one further to the left, represents the untitled spirit of her home, preserved through the buttons. But let's go back to the ones to the right. She built them in 1981. Her intervention is to create a charged landscape. The work is partly a homage to Igbo Landing, a fundamental story of Black freedom seeking that unfolds at the other end of the march. For four decades, these sculptures have sat unmarked and unknown cracking and sinking into the marsh, just as the artist intended. So she's looking, she, these are actually sculpted pieces from her environment that she's preserving that will eventually turn into ruins. Buchanan died in 2015. David Hammonds, next one. Okay, David Hammonds has these hair guards this is actually hair that you're seeing here. It's in hair gardens, black. He, what he says is, I make these hair gardens because black hair is the only thing not of the oppressor's culture. Honoring traditional black female craft of hair design, it was his impetus. And also the black body as both, both form and power. And then other slides you'll see him doing uh, body sculptures with his body. But every day, he was very concerned with everyday cultural artifacts, the stuff of the streets, and how to make art out of them. This one to your left is called Flight of Fancy. The spine is made out of 45 RPM record wings, and it's wrapped in colored cotton, threaded with small balls of black hair. You can see that. Um, the other one, you see all those small balls to your right standing up from the ocean as though they're filtering um, or looking through them at the water are also small hair wrapped around the wire. One of his pieces that I don't have here, I don't even know if it's available, he built this bottle tree and he placed it in an abandoned Harlem lot and he said, there are lots of spirits on this tree of bottles, just bottles I find on the street, liquor bottles, you know, beverage bottles, Coke bottles, lots of spirit there because every bottle has a black man's lips on it. Next one, another David Hammond's piece. You can see again, these are the black hair, the ropes are tied together through cloth to the right on the wall. The next one you see African traditional uh, textiles, framing black hair. Um, and then you see here Bruce Tolleman's a photograph of Damon Hammond, David Hammonds making body prints. Okay. Next one. Um, this is Sengan Ngunduri. 
she uses women's hosiery, reflecting black female body and sexuality. That's what she's doing here. You can see there, these are abstractions of the black female body, the expansiveness of the black female body relative to childbirth. You can imagine that one further to your right and the resilience through time and space in the center. And the one on the end, very much replicating uh, the sexuality of the black female body through these ho this hosiery. And all of this hosiery in these different shades of browns and blacks, um, she very much wanted that to be uh, uh, emblematic of black female and her resilience and the various shapes that her body uh, con is constituted through. Next one. This is Nora Porfoy. Um, he is really concerned about commodification and how he can use found objects, repurpose them, um, sand them, remake them to create rituals of uh, life and community and art making that perhaps can supersede what it means to turn everything into a tr the transactional, uh, you know, kind of political economy of money and um, commerce. Okay, Alan Loving. Um, Interesting story about Alan Loving. I'm unconscious time. Interesting story about Alan Loving. Um, very um, uh, celebrated artist. The painting to your left is his painting um, at the Whitney of Black artists, Black, Black abstract artists. Alvin Loving was invited to be a part of that. His painting was the one at the at the opening. I think this was in the late fifties. I, I just don't remember. I should have. I thought I had it down there. But you walk in the door and you see this cubist, starkly cubist piece. But he got so much criticism from this from the Black Arts Movement and many community members because they were saying, "We walk through the door. We want to see Black art, and this is what we get." And this, he took this to heart and began to think about how does this represent the community? He was still very, very involved in uh, civil rights movement. And as part of another exhibit, he went to see the quilt makers. And he was so moved by the quilts and taking to heart the criticism of black abstraction as being irrelevant to the black community deciding, no, it's not that I'm gonna stop being a black abstract artist, but I want to do the kind of abstraction that comes out of my tradition in terms of African traditional arts and African-American quilt making. So he takes these pieces and cuts them up and puts them up and hangs them in this way. Okay, over to your right, next one. This is another, um, more recent loving piece where he's really looking at the circularity of abstraction and how what he was concerned about is a circularity as a, of abstraction as constraining at one level coloring that can't seep through or energies that can't seep through the circularities of confinement but at the same time are there and can be deceived as something beautiful. Next one. This is Sam Gilliam again. Sam Gilliam is very interested in breaking through traditional art making and artwork. He would take colors and he would take the fabric and fold it and play with it and manipulate it in many ways and discover what kind of colors come from that. He would also did away with the stretcher and the canvas and wanted his, his colors that were made through the manipulation of fabric to be more kind of improvisational performance with each gallery. So, the, so you would have this material being displayed at different sites and it would look differently depending on how it was arranged on the wall. 
The next one, please. Um, this is, oh, this is Joe Overstreet. Joe Overstreet too was very concerned with canvas and paint, but what he also wanted to do, he was also very concerned that, and this is in his words, my paintings don't let the onlooker glance over them, but rather take them deeply into, but, but take the paintings deeply inside and then let them out many times, routing and rerouting in the space. These trips are taken sometimes subtly and sometimes suddenly. He's saying this is how he wants the paint to speak to the observer. He was particularly notable for removing canvases from the wall and suspending them in space, giving painting a sculptural dimension. He saw such pieces as, among other things, experiments in how to situate art and viewers in physical space. So he defied the paint, the, the paintings being on the wall and wanted you to move through them. So you need uh, we're, yeah. we're gonna have to wrap up. We've got oh five my gosh. minutes. I <laughs> am so sorry. I am so very sorry. And tell you your energy level is just building and building. I know. And I wanted to talk about Jeff Witten, but um well, we'll save it for next week. I have three. I think it would be great if we could just pick up where you're leading off now. And okay. as for uh, questions, we have those all recorded and we can discuss them then next okay. week. I promise okay. I'll be more mindful of time. I would okay. be absolutely more, more mindful of time. Um, enthusiasm okay. and mindfulness of time are not necessarily reconcilable. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay, can I just give you the homework assignment? Yes. <laughs> Okay, the homework assignment is please keep a journal or a notebook or some papers that's special to this assignment. First thing, I want you to notice the unnoticed in your daily life. So if you walk your dog, if you're going, if you're if you're in the garden, if you're walking wherever, but you but to be outside from your car to your job, notice something that is unnoticeable. Okay, and imagine you're taking a selfie. You're not actually taking a selfie, but imagine that you are, okay? So this means that you are taking a photograph of this thing that is ordinary and not special, and you have to remember it. And in your journal, write about it, or maybe even sketch it, all right? So you're taking this imaginary shot snapshot of something that is unnoticeable, unnoticeable that you notice. So we have a slide of the homework assignment and we're going yes. to send that out to all participants. Okay. And, uh, the um, other thing very quickly, and I'm gonna let you go, is I want you to um, look at a piece of abstract art and just look at it very slowly, very, very slowly. And I want you to look at it every single day. The same piece, don't change it, but the same. So you're going to be looking at it every day for the next seven days. And you're going to look at, take your time and look at it. This one you can see, it's there and you can look at it every day. That's fabulous. So you'll be getting, everyone will be getting some mail from us and uh, we will be saving the questions for next time. Um, Professor Madison, I want to thank you for opening our eyes to the relationship of Black abstraction to both European abstraction tradition and also African and other languages of, of, of abstraction. That was a, a wonderful way to open up the topic. And we also got a note from a participant, I believe Patricia, thanking you for taking the time to allow us to look slowly at many of the works of art that you uh, put on the screen for us. So uh, with that, we're gonna have to wrap up. We, we promise to uh, let people out when we say we're going to. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to all of you joining us again next week, same time, same station, same Zoom link, and uh, look in your inbox for some mail with, with us, from us. So- Could I get a copy of the questions? Sure, okay. I'll we'll send you the questions. and. Okay. So that'll give you some time uh, to react to them. And we can also send out your answers if you'd like that. Otherwise it can be done in real time. So um, 
Audience members, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This was absolutely delightful, and we look forward to continuing it next week. Thank you.